Okay, welcome back to the third session. Our first speaker in this session is Robert. So Robert did his PhD at University of California, Davis in Daniel Cox's lab, and he did a postdoc in Princeton in Ned Wingreen's lab. And he's currently the professor of um, systems biology at Imperial and Department of Life Sciences. Um, he leads the biological physics group, and he also leads Imperial's physics of life network. So over to you, Robert. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my slide and can you hear me? Yeah, I can see it and hear you clearly. Very good. So today I wanted to talk about uh, morphospace. That means uh, the shape space of cell and the dynamics of, of that space as well. And then the dimensionality of cell behavior. So I will talk mostly about large eukaryotic cells, which have this nucleus and how these changes um, uh, in shape occur. And in particular, then I want to focus on this low dimensional space. And here's just a picture of from a principal component analysis, looking at a, an example of this low dimensional space. So what I find super exciting about science is that it uh, happens over very many time scales and length scales, let's say five orders in, in terms of cell biology, and so at each level there are new rules emerging. So we could think about the lowest levels that say as physics very important, that let's say ligands binding receptors, if you like. But the question is really, you know, what are these physical uh, constraints and also if cells are pushing themselves towards them? And then at the next level, we, we, we approach this level of molecular and cell biology, and then we see these very complicated regulatory pathways. And then if we go even further in, in scale, then we can think of all these molecular um, microscopic processes reading out on the membrane and deforming the cell. And uh, if you talk about sequences of these shapes in, 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 in times, then we have cell behavior. So then you can say, oh, we have uh, many different cells. So we have a tissue. Then we could talk about the physiology of the tissue. If you had many uh, neurons, you would have a brain. We could talk about psychology. And if you had many individuals, we can go into uh, sociology. So this was very nicely put in words by Phil Anderson. And most people probably know this. And this article was different. And more recently, in Trendstrom's article is about the hierarchical structures of nature. So this also creates a lot of challenges, how to bridge these different lengths and time scales. And even, you know, in very long time scales, we reach a limit of non-stationarity potentially, so the lifetime of a cell, if you like. And what I find really fascinating is how, um, um, you know, uh, purposeful behavior, maybe even intelligent behavior emerges from these uh, microscopic rules. Um, so I want to talk about these different levels very briefly as an introduction. So this is uh, physics level, and there has been really nice work by Burke and Purcell in the 70s, which also influenced me quite a bit. Um, they basically ask if you have a small cell, how accurately can it sense a ligand concentration in its environment? And uh, you have these little patches where they sense a ligand, if you think receptors. And they came up with this very simple model. So they were interested in this relative uncertainty of this ligand concentration. You make a few assumptions, Poisson process, whatever. And in the end, you get these cute formulas, which depend only on physics and geometry. So you have the diffusion constant, which is important, the size of the cell, and the measurement time over which it can average. We can also go to a single receptor and think about the binding unbinding curve in a certain amount of time. Burke and Purcell thought the best a cell can do is take the average and infer the ligand concentration. But actually, the cell can do better by doing maximum uh, likelihood or even kinetic proofreading, but they cost an energy. And so also what they really, what they found is that where this is exciting is that cells seem to reach the limit, they seem to be optimized. So at the next level, I mentioned already these pathways, and this is really the domain of, of biology and which can be very complicated. So you have the ligand cyclic AMP, which binds, let's say in a particular example, to the receptor, and then you have all these parallel pathways. And uh, in the end, you know, people just draw arrows to actin polymerization or retraction of the rear. And actin is these sort of red filaments which deform the cell. And then people draw an arrow to chemotaxis down here. Um, you know, how cells can move up a chemical gradient, but how this evolves in a space and time sense is not answered in these networks. You could zoom in in the actin polymerization and you realize that there's this huge zoo of molecules regulating things, branching, bundling, binding to the membrane, and so on. This is a very complicated level to work at, and maybe one can hope at a higher level um, it's getting easier. So if you talk about behavior, we could talk about stereotypical behavior, which is these reoccurring behaviors, which are very important. And um, to make life simple, we could start with something simple like a vertebrate, like a horse. We hopefully know a lot about it. 
And um, of course, you might imagine this, the behavior is limited by the limited amount of joints and muscles you have, um, and that it's, it's that it's actually quite easy. But um, you know, since the late 19th century, um, artists with an astute eye for things, they think they got things wrong. So when you look at a galloping horse, uh, they painted these flying horses with all the hoofs detached. And um, this turned out to be not right. Um, by doing very careful um, photography um, with short shutter times and Mybridge, and you might know the story in uh, Palo Alto, he, he looked at these very carefully. And he, you know, he found flying horses. You have them here, but in this case, the, the legs are very different in configurations. If one, if the legs are spread out like in the paintings, then one hoof is normally on the ground. Um, so now, if you talk about, um, and I hope the movie is playing, um, uh, when you talk about cells, now all these landmarks are missing. You don't have eyes, you don't have legs, and so on. And you see these morphing shapes, um, in particular here, a cell moving up a chemical gradient. And it forms these protrusions, these active and protrusions. They seem to split at some point, and the cell has to make a decision to go left or right, and so on. And so, what I'm very interested in is understanding this shape, how to describe it, in particular, also then how to relate it with these lower scales, these physical principles. So, how do we do this all? So, as a postdoc, um, I extended the working per cell limit to gradient sensing. So, here's the uncertainty of, of gradient, but it depends again in the end on the same. Um, uh, constants, here's the mean concentration versus cells. And then you have to bridge some of the scales. So in experiments, you look at the chemotactic index, how well moved towards a uh, pipette with some chemical coming out. And you see close to it, it works very well. It's close to one, um, but far away, you know, it works less, less, less accurate, of course, we would expect that. But what then the model uh, did um, was it predicted that all this data on the left would collapse uh, onto a single curve on the right. And uh, if you plot it only as a function of the signal to noise ratio, meaning the gradient versus the noise, which is the background, uh, and so depended only a single fitting parameter. But of course, we didn't know exactly what these chemical concentrations look like from a pipette. It was just guesstimated. So, um, so we, we did some experiments or a collaboration with Doris Heinrich, looking at the chemical gradients and microfluidics at the same time as looking at the cells, and then looking at hundreds of cells. And you can see um, that the thing is uh, nicely collapsing on this, this fundamental limit without any refitting. What it then also allowed us to do is um, ask the question, is the behavior of cell different in uh, shallow gradients down here, small signal noise ratio versus steep gradients? Is the shape and behavior different? Um, so what we did is then, you know, looking at these many cells, we can do principal component analysis. So you ask, what are the modes of variability around some average shape of the cell? And um, uh, what we found then is, um, uh, somewhat surprisingly, is that only three modes are required to produce 90%, uh, let's say, of this variability you have in your data. And we call some elongation, splitting, and polarization. Um, we've also found then um, that in shallow gradients or signal-to-noise ratio being low, cells form these protrusions, and that's um, uh, characteristic. And in steep gradient, things are different. But not only shape space is low dimensional, even the behavior seems low dimensional. So you can put these cells back into this low dimensional space. And you see that in shallow gradients, um, cells move alternating between elongation and splitting. It goes back and forth. It's like a run and tumble movement. While in steep gradients, where the signal is very strong, cells essentially keep their shape and then they just move in the right direction. This is uh, more like the compass model um, in, this, uh, in this field. Um, very briefly, also, one can reproduce these shapes quite easily using a Meinhardt model. It's effectively a reaction diffusion model on a, on a flexible membrane. All you need is three species, a local activator, which is in green, which pushes the membrane out, and then the local inhibitor destroys it, and then the pseudopod splits, and then the global inhibitor effectively suppresses um, lateral pseudopods. So the principal component analysis looks very similar. It's not surprising, I think. These are just the low energy excitations of the membrane. But then when you look at um, uh, but look at behavior, it looks very similar to the to the to the experiments, and this I think is not trivial. Just to complete this now, this little idea. So this was just a, an undergraduate project, but I'm included it here to complete the cycle. So what does it have to do all with the shapes and behavior with the accuracy of sensing in terms of chemotaxis? So here we did a very simple model. 
where we had on one hand um, a, a very basic model where the cell decides between left and right of pseudopods and moves up six sec up the gradient. And it works very well in shallow gradients because it's very noisy, it's biased random work, we expect it to work. In steep gradients, then we would expect um, uh, we, it doesn't work so well, and then we have a simple compass model where the cell finds the direction as accurately as possible, and that only works very well when you have a strong signal to noise ratio. Um, so I talked about the shapes, and now can we predict anything in particular about the behavior over long times? And so here we use the maximum entropy method, um, which is in this case called maximum caliber. Caliber because the diameter of a tube de determines the flow speed, and caliber is then the, the maximum caliber is the dynamic version of it. Um, so what you do here is then you write down a Shannon entropy-like expression, um, and this is the probability of a trajectory in our case. And if you would maximize this now with respect to these probabilities, you would get um, a flat distribution, so the maximum entropy distribution. So, but now the cool thing is you can also add constraints from experiments, uh, like these observations, these observables, and this is like Roche multipliers, and then you can redo this and you, get, um, you can capture these, um, these constraints. You get Boltzmann-like probability distributions as well, um, what you would expect actually. And so the question is now, what are these trajectories? What can you do with it? So these trajectories are actually now trajectories in this principal component, in this shape space. So what we do is then we look at trajectories, let's say in these different principal components, it's just an illustration. We look at a certain time point and the neighboring time point. It's just a few seconds away. And then we ask in the data, how often does is one principal component going up or down, or is it going up and followed by another going up and so on, and even also between the principal components. So once you train your maximum caliber model, you can make predictions. In particular, you can ask, are the predicted probabilities matching the observed probabilities? So you look for patterns of behavior like up and down and things like that, little words like a dictionary. And you can see the correlated model uh, works very well, or these are only short-term correlations and the non-correlated doesn't work very well. And here's an example. You could also say, hey, I give you some uh, shapes. Can you just now tell me the difference if it's a, a healthy or wild type cell versus a mutant or a drug treated cell? So shapes are very similar, that so discrimination wouldn't work, but I can I can use the uh, Lagrange multipliers, which describes the transitions between different shapes um, and make uh, very good classifiers based on this. So that works very well. Um, so, so, so lastly, I, I wanted to briefly talk about how to bridge these different space and, and temporal scales. And this was done, uh, work done with Brian Stramer lab at, um, at uh, King's College uh, London and with a postdoc Dana Schumacher. Here I don't talk about the theory, I just show a little bit the examples from the experiments. So how does it work now? So in classic textbooks, you see the cell migration is this five step cycle, which you show on the left where effectively at some point, step two, the cell makes an uh, extension by actin polymerization and pulls itself forward by adhesion and contraction. But we see now this leading edge, which is so important in this formalism, is actually not very well correlated um, with the direction of motion. Uh, even if you look at the largest extension, it doesn't work very well. And so this is against this dogma of, of cell biology, actually. So what is then really important, uh, what we found is that uh, actin flows in the cell are the key thing. So yes, these retrograde actin flows towards the sink where they are degraded, these filaments, and this is highly stable. So the autocorrelation is highly, uh, is, is very strong and um, uh, even stronger than the direction of cell motion while the extensions don't work very well. And uh, you don't have any steps, no delays effectively we found. So the more integrated view is now that we have these flows, these actin flows, and they are very stable and they integrate all these fast processes at the membrane where the sensing happens in these little protrusions and so on. Um, yeah, what is then the um, take home message from this talk? Um, I, I talked about the physics in particular, what are the physical limits and if the cell can push themselves towards it and how this then translates to cell behavior, which is fascinating because it goes over these orders of magnitude. I also talked about this maximum entropy method where we can with very simple um, statistical physics um, predict um, long-term cell behavior even over, over minutes and hours. Also, these correlations are only uh, seconds we included in our formalism. And lastly, I bridged, I try to bridge these different uh, times and length scales 
by looking at these actin flows, which seems to integrate all these fast processes into this highly persistent engine of the cell, if you like. Um, so some of these things I talked about were um, uh, a little bit older to put it in this uh, coherent picture, but what is currently all, all going on in the group is we're trying to extend this to uh, three dimensions, um, three dimensional cell shapes. And um, this is quite interesting because of course there's this extracellular matrix and, and different modes of migration. We're also thinking about uh, collectives, not only of cells, but also of, of nematodes. And then um, we also think about other ways to do um, low dimensional representations. Instead of principal component analysis, we could uh, do deep learning uh, via outer encoders. It's another way to do it. And finally, I think an interesting, fascinating question is, can we extend ideas of intelligence to cells? So of course, we would need a definition of intelligence, which doesn't involve, involve uh, brains or even a nervous system. And one way to do it would be to look at these fast protrusions, these extensions of the cell, how the cell can sample and predict almost its, in, its future and based on that can make informed decisions. So that's an, these are all ongoing projects. Um, here, I just wanted to take the, take the opportunity to um, thank in particular my current group. Uh, here are some snapshots from teams and as well my collaborators and some funding sources. So, so thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, are there any questions? So there's one on the, the chat from Bati Zakirov. If you'd like to, uh, on um, whether the PCA is performed on raw pixel data or whether there's some representation that's more amenable to PCA? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. So we, so we, um, we, we, what we, what we did first is, um, we uh, we followed, you know, you do segmentation, obviously, in the beginning. So you do segmentation to get the outline, so you don't apply directly to the cell images. And once you have the outline, uh, then, um, of course, you could try now to do it directly on these outlines. But what we did is uh, we, we converted this x, y coordinate of the outline into Fourier space, did actually a, a, a power spectrum. Um, and the idea with the power spectrum was that we don't have to worry about the orientation of cells. It's effectively the Fourier transformation of the order correlation function. And in that way, it was a, the, the, the benefit was that we don't have to uh, worry about aligning cells anymore, um, which is, you know, shape shouldn't be depending on size or alignment or orientation. And that's also why these principal components are so symmetric and a little bit odd looking. But otherwise, it was a cool descriptor. Good question. And, and does it make any difference whether you um, uh, take your principal components just from the cells at, say, a, a particular time point, or do you actually include all time points when you generate your, your principal components? Yeah, good question. Of course, you know, you would like to use as much data as you can. You're always limited on that side. But um, there's, of course, no point in taking all these uh, um, all the, um, uh, time snapshots because you know you see essentially the same thing again and again. So, so what you can do is you can calculate things like um, just on the raw images, order correlations as well, and see where things decay in time. And then you can make sure you sample new images effectively where the decay has happened. So you, you, you sample, you subsample effectively. And, um, and so you don't uh, bias things by just looking at the same cell again and again, which didn't move very much. Yeah, so it's, it did say yeah. Are there any other questions? I can't see any other hands up. Or so maybe, maybe I ask, a, I have a question. Oh, so go for it. Not, not scientific question, but I'm just curious. So you are in the life sciences department and you do biophysics. So now let's play the devil's advocate. Oh no. Should, should, <laughs> I mean, I, I just am curious about your response. So should, should this kind of research be done in the physics department at all? Or it's, <laughs> should be done in the life sciences or this question is just boot is not relevant. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess if you think of sort of a more Anglo-Saxon model, um, especially the American model, um, the things are much more fluid. Yeah, In the physics department, you can do quite a lot of biology, I would say. In a biology department, it's quite, um, you can do, you know, theory and so on. Um, I think it's quite similar in the UK and especially at Imperial College. You know, we have our center for uh, systems biology 
and there are other people with a physics and mathematics background. So I think you know the distinction is of course very much blurred now, I guess. But then in other countries like Germany, I would say um, it's quite additional still, with some exceptions like the you know Dresden and so on, the Dresden model. Um, so I, I think you know in, in in Germany you would do say you know in a physics department you better do really physics and and you know you have to be careful to stay on the physics side of things so it smells and looks like physics. But uh, but yeah, I think it's it's become certainly um, yeah just more more blurry. I think yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so there's one one question from Nate Goering. Um, I don't know, Nate, would you like to ask a question in person? Sure. I was just uh, very interesting stuff on the, on the actin. The, um, do you think that that's a that brings together that model sort of unifies distinct modes of migration, right? Because people have talked about lamella and podium migration, Lebing front, low friction models. Does that all sort of map back onto the sort of idea that it's really the act and flow that drives. Everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good question. So, um, so you could think like you know before I talked about these pseudopods, it's this two-dimensional driven uh, amoeba, and uh, and then you know in the textbook example, I think you talk one talks normally more about this adhesion, uh, mesenchymal type of migration, and you know all these modes of migration do they really exist? And that's almost like a controversy in the in the literature. Um, so, so we do. We think, especially you know Brian Stream. I, I hope I, I'm sort of paraphrasing Brian Stream correctly. He's an expert in it, but I, but but he thinks I think that these actin flows they are, they are uh, universal across modes of migrations and cell types. Even if in one case it looks more pseudopod driven, in other case you have still a melopodia, and in another case you might have something else again in the blapping and so on. I think underlying is always this flow. I think this. Is, he sources or resources in multiple cell types. Not all of them were included in the paper, even. Um, yeah, so this is this is I think now the I would think this is the engine, which is fantastic. I think so. I was always wondering how this all works together. How do how the cell knows what to do at the front and so on. It's all emergent and integrated into these flows. So so I like this picture quite a lot. Cool. Great. Well, thanks very much, Robert.